Hello everyone, it is Joe here from OmniPoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. If you're looking for PTCG live codes, make sure you check out the Potown store. You can get a 5% discount on your orders using that code OmniPoke. For today's video, we're going to be looking at the Champions League results, which was the first big tournament in Japan with the Twilight Masquerade cards legal, essentially what we're going to be getting in our NAIC format, which is somehow only a month away. And uh, yeah, we have seven of the top eight deck lists. Thanks to my detective work and looking uh, down the list, we see that the top deck, this is a Maridon EX, and the only deck we're missing is also Maridon EX. So there might be some variation to the other list, but it should mean we have very good coverage over... Uh, um, basically all of the top eight and a few top 16 decks in there as well. So the tournament was won and also got a top eight, uh, was Maridon of all things, making that big comeback. I think in this current format, there's probably too much Charizard around for Maridon to be a well-placed choice in the metagame. But going into this new format, Dragapult was certainly public enemy number one in the Japanese format. And this has a pretty decent time into that matchup where the Iron Hands, especially with its chunky hit points, can't be dealt with very easily, which does give the Maridon players potential situations where they can take four prizes with one Iron Hands. Uh, even if the opponent is hitting it with Dragapult twice and then maybe brings up something like Squawkabilly or Mew or something to take a four prize turn back, that then gives the Maridon player the option to take those last two prize cards with Raichu very likely. So uh, you can get the ball rolling very quickly against Dragapult, force them to be on all cylinders, and even if they are, because the Dragapult is a low damage output archetype, they can't really deal with Iron Hands all that well. And one of the other archetypes that is very capable at dealing with Dragapult in the format is Lugia, and as we know, Maridon has always historically had a very decent time into Lugia, uh, so you're basically good into the two sort of best decks that were vying for contention in the format. Uh, so it's no surprise to see Maridon be the medical for the tournament. It's not too different to what we've seen in the past where it has um, the three Maridons at the helm trying to search out, obviously Iron Hands, Raikou and Raichu. You still got the Zapdos in here as a math fix option and a single prize attacking threat. For the new cards coming out from this set, there is one copy of Tatsugiri coming in here. It's a really handy Pokemon. When it's in the active, you can look at the top six, grab a supporter card uh, from there and put it straight into your hand. Because there's already two rescue boards, you can obviously find a way to grab this Tatsu at some point during the game. And it does give you that bit of safety net against Iona, which is typically one of the bigger issues for the archetype. Uh, obviously, there's still Mew EX in here. And there's also the Radiant Greninja, which we haven't seen. Well, it's kind of been in and out of Mirage on list but with energy going this high now with 16 basic lightning and two double turbo obviously trying to help out with hands and mew to some extent as well um giving yourself maride on draw throughout the game also seems like a pretty reasonable option uh have a couple of bravery charms in here as well this can be t potentially handy for mirror match situations as we've seen in the past uh yeah i feel like with charizard being far less of the like big threat in the metagame there's obvious reasons why maride on should be a, a valid choice once again and this seems like a very streamlined list, which is obviously what you need in a best of one situation. Has all the draw engine Pokemon, has enough sort of help to get you over the line when you're getting hit with Ionos. You have enough like onboard presence Pokemon to make things happen. So yeah, it seems like a really well-placed archetype and it's probably going to be back on the map uh, in this format as long as uh, things play out how we are kind of expecting because Dragapult has been absolutely smashing the City Leagues and also made top four at this tournament. So by no means flopped whatsoever, uh, is still doing uh, really, really good things. So it's uh, expectation that Dragapult is going to be making waves this format. However, the other finalist deck was actually back to Gardevoir, which is a really interesting uh, thing to see. The list is so crazy and so different from other lists that I've seen in recent City Leagues. One of the main standouts is that there's a Hyper Aroma Ace spec in here, allowing you to grab three... Uh, evolution Pokemon and get them straight into your hand, so you're getting those Curliers out straight away. And rather than playing Arvin TM Evolution, which is in the vast majority of lists that we've seen from Gardevoir, even in this format, but also out in Japan, it's playing Irida instead to give you access to early Manaphy for protection, or uh, Greninja to get you a little bit of extra card draw here and there. Very surprising to see both the Ace spec choice, because of course we have Reset Stamp as well, which has been very popular in Gardi. Uh, but even just things like uh, Scoop Up Cyclone is interesting. Um, Prime Catcher, obviously an interesting one. 
I think for the most part in Japan, pro, um, the reset stamp has been the go-to for Gardevoir. So seeing Hyper Aroma as just a consistency card instead, very, very interesting stuff. And the trade-off of Arvin versus Irida's weird because you're still playing two copies of Bravery Charm anyway. You're not going crazy with the uh, Luxurious Cape and you're not playing Heroes Cape as well. That's obviously another big A spec that's sometimes a go-to. Um, but you do have a Monkey Dory in the list, which I've been really, really impressed by with, by the way. Uh, I've been doing some testing over the last three days. It's been a long weekend for us. We've had a bank holiday. Um, so I've been using this card in Gardevoir and in a few other decks as well. This card is legit. It really is. It's a fantastic means of setting up Pokemon throughout the game or just helping you push into certain thresholds. Certainly going to be important with uh, Screamtail. Makes it a much more dangerous sniping threat. Now you can deal with um, more than just uh, Skorkabilly. You can hit Luminions. You can hit uh, EX, like other basic EXs, much more easily. Uh, and it's also going to help push Drifloon. Uh, so, yeah, very, very strong card overall. And you've got Cress in here as well for even more potential, like, healing players to do some shenanigans. There's a lot of shenanigans going on uh, with the Guard of War package. And I'm stunned, honestly, to see Aroma over other cards. Um, but we have seen some other, like, really copium, <laughs> like, search cards in Guard of War in the past. Like, we've seen Great Balls even to an extent. I still feel like Arvin Evo is probably going to be the go to. Because I do think things like Hero's Cape and Stamp are, I think, preferable. But again, it's a best of one format. So just having a hyper aroma to just play the game is somewhat reasonable. Some other big call-outs. The Temple of Sinnoh is becoming much more popular in a number of archetypes. Not just Gardevoir are going to be playing this one. Going to give you a lot of help around uh, Lugia. Because you're certainly worried about their new A-spec energy. The Legacy energy, I think it's called. Uh, and there's a couple of other archetypes that want to use uh, those colorless energy, but I think it's mostly uh, going to be Lugia, but also there's a number of Pidgeot builds of Dragapult, which can play Neo Upper as well. Sometimes shutting that off alongside like Hand Disruption and stuff can be relevant, but I think it's mostly like a Lugia card um, to make life difficult for those sorts of archetypes, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, the Monkey Dory is... Uh, the way it works is you slap a darkness energy on it and then you can move three counters off one of your Pokemon onto one of your opponent's Pokemon. Uh, there's decks like Blissey where you can use multiple Monkey Dory and that's when it gets really crazy. You can almost be doing like 90 damage snipes essentially with this card if you have enough bench space for multiple of them. Uh, Blissey's one of the best abusers of it but with Gardevoir just finding this at any point during the game, finding your darkness energy, banking that on board gives you a lot of value because obviously you're self-damaging with Gardevoir so every turn of the game you can force a means of Monkey Dorying stuff uh, which is really really dangerous and I think a fantastic upgrade for Gardevoir that will be staying even if we don't still see the Irida hyper aroma and go back to sort of more traditional counts of stuff with Arvin Evo I think the Monkey Dory like definitely stays it's a very very good combo uh, in the deck Moving on to top four then, where we do see our first Dragapult. Some interesting stuff going on in this list. So first of all, the backup engine is Zartu. This allows you to attach a Psychic, obviously, onto your bench. This really helps out Dragapult's awkward attack cost. Um, in this list, we're not seeing any Scoop Up Cyclone, but that's a common card that you see in Dragapult. And the Zartu really allows, is like an enabler for that. So you can pick something up, then go Zartu, turn attach the fire, go back into a new Dragapult kind of thing. With that, it's a lot less mandatory, but if you're not playing Neo Upper, I think you need to have some energy acceleration, and it's probably going to come in the form of this 2-2 Zartu package. So it's going to be a commonplace include for the Dragapult, unless you're going Pidgeot Neo Upper. Um, that's a small thing to bear in mind. Interestingly, the list does play Enhanced Hammer, so maybe that's, again, respect for Lugia, uh, which can be an awkward matchup for this deck where they have such big one-hit code potential and have Iron Hands, and some lists play Wellspring Ogapon as well for early, like, snipe pressure. There's a lot that they're trying to do to take multiprize turns against you. So I can certainly see why E-Hammer's handy there, but also getting rid of Neo Upper in like Pidgeot uh, build mirrors uh, also seems quite reasonable. It's got a couple of copies of Rotom in here. Uh, no Luminion's an interesting one, but it's quite streamlined on its support account. Just playing the two boss, but you have so much access to the opponent's bench with Alakazam plus Dragapult anyway. I think that's pretty reasonable. And of course we have Arvin Counts Catcher as an option. The reset stamp does find its way into this list. You're seeing this a lot of times in Guardies, like I said, and it's actually less popular in Dragapult, but a lot of the time you are seeing uh, Scoop Up Cyclone. 
Uh, but that's to say that's not to say that this isn't a powerful card in Dragapot as well, because you can immediately put your opponent onto low hand sizes. And I think especially in what we're going to have in this format is there's going to be that question mark of like, here's the most expected inclusion, but then you can catch your opponent off guard with an early stamp if they're expecting you to play Cyclone as well. So that's one I need to weigh up. So far, I've only really tested with Scoop Up Cyclone, um, but I've tried stamping other archetypes and it has been an impressive card. So that's pretty cool. You've got Devo in here, obviously helps with the amount of counter placement you can sprinkle around multiple Pokemon, pick them all up in one go. Going to be important for mirror matches as well. It does have Arvan Evo. It's a great thing to go straight into double Dracloak or Dracloak Zartu to set itself up for that second turn in the game. Very common play is going to be going for Arvin, Poffin, Evo. Uh, that's very, very common if you've gone second. Even if you've gone first, sometimes on turn two, you can be doing plays like this. Uh, because like I said, especially if you haven't started with a Dreepy or if they're getting KO'd early, you need to have that Zartu uh, online. If you're going to commit your turn one attachment to the active, you want to be able to, if that active gets KO'd, go Zartu into turn attached to bring a Dragapult into the play. Uh, the next turn. See Collapse Stadium, quite similar, like echoes almost of like how Gardevoir and how Charizard have made things come together, uh, where you have the Forest Hill Stone for Rotom package. Just a couple candies because you are still leaning into that Evo that little bit. Um, I'm surprised by just seeing two Ultra Ball in here. That seems like a pretty low count. Uh, I think this list specifically maybe is quite high on the Vessel at three. Uh, oftentimes you'll see three Ultra, like two Vessel, something like that. Other Pokemon you sometimes see in here, the Tatsugiri that we saw in the Maridon deck, once again, can pop up in Dragapult here and there. Um, but overall, it's looking fairly straightforward. You don't always see the Hisuian Heavy. That's not super common in the list either. Uh, but I suppose when you have Arvin Tutor, it's not the worst thing to have in the world. So, yeah, that's not too far off from a pretty straightforward baseline of Dragapult. I think typically you don't see the E-Hammer. It's much more often a Sinnoh. Uh, and the A spec is also the sort of uncommon A spec of choice, but it's still up for debate. You know, it's still so early on in the City League data that perhaps the Champions League results will now change the tide and it will go towards reset stamp. You never know. Um, but yeah, it seems like a, a good inclusion overall. In top four, we have Lugia, which gains a couple of interesting cards. In terms of improving your engine, you gain Carmine, which is a potential discard hand draw five that you can use on the first turn of the game so that's where it's different to professor's research it's obviously weaker in terms of the amount of cards you draw but you can immediately get some discard synergy going on that first turn of the game uh, before your opponent can you know throw hand disruption at you or do this that and the other you can immediately just throw stuff which is great and it gives you a potential five cards deeper into your deck to find a turn one lugia uh, and just find more ball search cards in general so just having that immediacy seems like it's worthwhile um, UBD suit, or we have seen a number of Lugia lists where there are still, you know, at least like one copy of research, sometimes two research and two Carmine. That split is going to kind of be the main debate, I suppose. But having three copies and for Ultra Ball and Luminion gives you pretty good access to this uh, on turn one. Uh, so that's the kind of big engine adjustments I think you could see in the list. We see double stadium in here again, mostly because Sinnoh is so popular right now. We're seeing it in Pult, we're seeing it in Gardevoir. Um, I don't think we're seeing it in many other decks, maybe Charizard, but I don't think it necessarily needs to play it. Those are the decks playing Sinnoh, so having a bounce for that's going to be important, so you can reactivate certainly your gift energies, but also your um, legacy energy, the A spec that Gardevoir play, that sorry, Lugia plays now, uh, where this gives you a rainbow energy effect, which means you can attack with Luminion and Iron Hands much more easily now, but also the Pokemon this is card is attached to uh, gives up one less prize card. So even if it's going on to, you know, your Blood Moon Ursa Luna or onto your Chinchino, say you've got like six energy on Chinchino or something crazy like that, if one of those is an upper, your opponent probably has to take out that Chinchilla uh, because it's threatening so much prize pressure, but if they don't get a prize for it back, if they don't have their E-Hammer or their Sinnoh on the right turn, that's going to be big, big value for you. So. I think it's a very, very powerful card. We still have the same chinchillas. Uh, we're going much more heavy on the 70 hit points uh, uh, Minchino because we have to respect the Dragapults, but also Monkey Dory in a number of decks as well that could target down the 60 hit pointer. So you do lose out on a pretty handy attacker, but you kind of have to pay the extra hit points now if you want to get in this in the mix against Dragapult, which obviously you do want to do. Uh, and yeah, just weaving in Iron Hands a little bit more cleanly than having to play like Vessel and Basic Energy. Blood Moon also being a really efficient late game attacker where obviously its attack cost is reduced similar to Radiant Charizard as the game goes on and as your opponent has taken a number of prize cards. So you can go 
pretty aggressively committing to um, your Cincinos, knowing you have like a one or two energy uh, end game attack as well, which is pretty uh, valid. So a cool engine upgrade and more reasons to play Lugia, I suppose, where you just have even more avenues for taking multi-prize turns and you have a slightly more stable late game if you are having like ugly car mines, awkward discards, uh, or prizing a number of energy cards, you can still get over the line thanks to Blood Moon being a much more efficient attacker. Uh, and also, uh, I think in a similar vein, the fact that you can have Archeops targeted early, you still have Blood Moon, which can catch you up as well. So yeah, Lugia also seems like a pretty decent archetype right now, uh, certainly. We have another um, Dragapult list in top eight. This is also not playing uh, Cyclone, which is super interesting because that's been the City League like go-to for a while. This one's playing Prime instead. Um, kind of interesting, obviously allowing you to just push things out of the way to capitalize on your uh, counter placement is a big component of the archetype uh, because certainly if you're hitting into like basic EX Pokemon or whatever, you can push them to the bench and then finish them off with a sprinkle. So having that element in the deck is no doubt uh, really, really important. You can see the double Sinnoh in this list. Usually it's just one copy, but sometimes you can go up to two. Obviously respecting Lugia as like a metagame call, as I mentioned, is playing the Tatsu in this list. Uh, still just playing the two Ultra Ball. That's, these, are, these are some low counts when you want to try and get your, <laughs> your Pult online. Uh, and it's playing the split of Rotom and Luminion. That's a split that I personally prefer just to get you in the game that little bit more. Obviously Arvin's a, a big deal when you are going second. It's playing the fifth Psych Energy, but nothing too crazy there. Sometimes you see seven totals, sometimes you see the eight like this. Um, but yeah, similar story here where it's the Zartu build rather than Pidgeot. This is the one I've played the most of. Uh, but I think Pidgeot is still an interesting uh, one to have. And actually, there's another engine here, also in top eight, which is a Lost Zone predominantly engine where you have early game pressure from Cramorant. You have the sort of stabilization sort of mid game where you have this great draw engine of Dracloak helping alongside your Confes. And you have Dragapult being a really high damage output option where you obviously can gate it out all in one turn. And then you also have the one prize Charizard as an option in here as well. It's kind of cool that you can play an entirely one prize game, uh, just having Dracloaks on your board to give you just in general more consistency throughout the mid game. Uh, and having like Radzard as a great attacking threat is also pretty reasonable. But then when you need to, you can go for a big Dragapult play and it can be burst onto the board as and when you like. So very dangerous. Obviously extra damage counter placement with Sableye means that you just have a lot to play around with. A lot of interesting, intricate strategy you can go in with these two Pokemon combined. So there is some decent internal synergy actually coming into the list. It makes your Buddy Puffin like way, way stronger as well. And with an, a breakpoint often only requiring four, because you're obviously not too involved in getting gates until you in, are into that sort of mid to late game. Um, it's fine to only have like a couple confe early and then have board space for Dreepies. Yeah, one I need to experiment with uh, reminds me of a list that I've played around with for a bunch of time, which was the Charizard EX plus Lost Zone Engine package which I've been lured into more than once for more than one tournament. <laughs> so uh, I'm certainly going to give time to an archetype like this as well. Um, just regular Lost Zone, even without this Dragapult, just very aggressive, like Sableye Cram has also been doing okay in City Leagues as well, which I think is an interesting thing to sort of keep track of. And then running out the last of the top eight decks, like I said, we're missing one Maridon list, but that was the last top eight uh, deck. Uh, as well as uh, this Snorlax, where one control Snorlax made it into the top eight as well. As for new cards, we have this new uh, Whistle, I think it's called, or is it a Flute? I can't remember. Uh, but it's looking at the top five, forcing a Pokemon uh, onto their bench if you find one from the top of their deck. And obviously giving yourself four attempts at this can give you a Pokemon to cheese and to try and block. We've got the new tool, which is it's like a fan, I think it's called. Like, I don't know what sort of fan it is, but either way, your opponent hits into you. You get to move an energy from the attacking Pokemon onto another one of their Pokemon. So it gives you uh, a new means of sort of controlling your opponent's resources by making it more difficult for them. Uh, to you know, throw energy onto annoying Pokemon that they can't really attack with too easily. It can allow you to have the sort of trapping strategy that little bit more. Um, it's got the pretty standard Pokemon lineup, to be honest with you. No Pidgeot, obviously, and just playing more of the same in terms of the disruption supporters. Nothing too surprising with this one, uh, to be honest with you. 
yeah, just looks like it's it's scary that this item is a four of and was in the highest placing list because this was really what I feared. That even though the effect of the card isn't that strong, the fact that you get four attempts at it and essentially it can be, oh, I've immediately won because I've been able to whistle this one Pokemon into play. <laughs> so that's one thing I don't want to see. Uh, moving on to a couple of the top 16 lists, we don't have all of them just yet, uh, so it should be worth checking back on Pokeko Book, that's the website I'm on right now, um, at some point, but so far we have an Ancient Box, I think there's actually no new cards in this list whatsoever, so <laughs> it's a list that you could play right now if you really wanted to, uh, but there you go. We then have another Lost Box, this is quite similar to what we've been seeing a decent chunk of, where it's quite one price focused, but then has the lightning stuff of Raikou and Iron Hands, obviously partially because Lugia is so popular, but Iron Hands being very powerful into uh, these evolving decks, still certainly good against Dragapult. And then you include the Blood Moon Ursaluna, so you have very good late game damage output if you can set things up with Sableye, set things up with Greninja, that sort of thing. The 240, sometimes for like one energy, is just very efficient. And one of the best things is that oftentimes to have high damage output late games with Lost Box, you had to try and piece together Mirage Gate combos. Now you just need to find a Blood Moon and attach to it. And that's a much better feeling, I think, as you're getting towards the late game. You are being hit with Hand Disruption. Now you only need to find one basic one energy. And, you know, you have Con Phase, you have Rescue uh, board, uh, Emergency Board on it. You have Greninja. You have a decent number of draws to try and get there. So I think that's a much better feeling deck now and your late game is much more secure, much more stable than in the, in the past. So good time for uh, for Lost Box as well still. We have a couple other builds of Lugia. This one's not mucking around with any uh, 60 hit points, Minchino. As you can see, sometimes you see a split of research, but Carmine being much more heavily played uh, between the two. This one even plays a basic lightning, which I think is super questionable, but there you go. Uh, and there's also the Wellspring Mask Ogapon EX. What's interesting about this, so its attack is 100 to the active and a 120 damage bench attack. Uh, but what's interesting is you get to, sh or you have to shuffle the energy back into your deck. So you can use the Neo Upper, but not like sacrifice it, which means you can still access that same energy onto your Luminion or onto your... Iron Hands later on in the game, which is pretty powerful, and obviously it's a great way to take a two-prize swing if your opponent hasn't been able to establish that mana fee. Just something else that people have to worry about in here. Interesting to see a 3-3 three, three Lugia line, but does play the one Nest Ball, so a slight min-max there, I suppose, because this is still a playable, like, turn one card. Just gives you small extra bonus odds of, like, leaving your fish, which is kind of terrible. I kind of want to see this put into another Lugia personally, but <laughs> I suppose it's a minor min-max. It's playing double Mezzagoza, no collapse, which is a little bit interesting. I suppose you do have more avenues to take multi-prize turns now. This deals with big stuff, this deals with little stuff, and the Wellspring can come sometimes get early game cheese plays. Kind of interesting. Not too different from the one that we saw previously. Another Lugia, so it certainly had a decent tournament. Uh, this still plays the Wellspring, not playing any of the Lightning Package, which is kind of bizarre. Plays a Snorlax in here as well. This one is much more heavy on the research, but it's playing Carmine. Also playing the uh, Thornton. One of the new stadiums that's also choosing to play is the Jamming Tower, which is turning off all tools. We saw the previous list played one Vacuum. This one's playing the Jammer. I think Jammer's better in Lugia because um, it's also giving you defense against uh, Sinnoh, which is kind of a big card right now. More Lugia doing well in top 16. It's looked like it had a really, really good tournament. Um, this one's playing the Weird Ear. This one's playing no Carmine. So there's still a debate of how many uh, Carmine versus Research you should be playing. This one's very heavy on Mezagoza as a stadium just to have that bounce but still have an effect. And then kind of the most interesting standouts for the top 16 is a, a Gouging Fire EX deck where you've got one cheeky um, Iron Valiant EX in here. It's got a couple grabbers in the list, which sounds so random and so bizarre uh, just to be weaved into this deck. You think you're like, what you've got is consistent enough, even though you're only playing like one gear and three shoes and three uh, of these. Instead of playing four copies and buffing these counts, you've just fit two grabber into your list and somehow that's just good. It's really like just... This guy's playing Poke out here. The other thing that's obviously insane is that it's playing two of the new Lucian supporter. 
which is uh, a coin flip for both players, right? <laughs> which is just so wild. It's like an Ilama, which is such a terrible effect. Like, this could be a judge, right? And just be a consistent, your opponent's always getting a pretty mid-sized hand. But you're trying to high roll your side as well. It's so unbelievably greedy. It's crazy. I think this is the wildest list I've seen in so long. And just every part of my body <laughs> like wants to reject this list for so much weird stuff that's going on in here. And I mean, Gouging Fire is really not doing great in our format. It's already like quite low on the consistency front. And this has decided to take out consistency slots for just extra like high roll greed. It's so insane. It's so insane, honestly. Oh man, Gouging Fire, top 16. Must be nice. Uh, if you really want to have a look, uh, there's a couple of the interesting decks in top 16. We just saw a Dialga and obviously that's the talk of the town after Indianapolis as well. Uh, this one is Arvin Evo, which is... And not what we saw uh, over the pond. Uh, there was a top 64 um, Greninja list as well, which is kind of cool. I haven't actually tested much of this because I couldn't find a list that I actually thought was reasonable. Uh, but this might be my starting point for Greninja going forward, where you got the Ark and the Pidgeot in here as well. Certainly not a bad archetype by any means, because, you know, we've seen that Rapid Strike in the past has had a lot of legs, and this is quite a similar archetype in that respect. You've got your... Cologne plays available to you um, to take some spread pressure. Yeah, there, there's some stuff to like about Greninja, certainly. Some more in top 64. Um, and obviously its meta position might be better now that like Maridon has made a stance for itself, or made a name for itself. Um, also, Blissey started to be picking up in popularity in City Leagues, and I've been personally impressed by that in my first like two or three days of testing, which isn't a lot. <laughs> like I, I've probably had less than 10 games with Blissey so far, uh, but it's been impressive from what I've seen. And it should also have a pretty good Maridon matchup and is pretty good into Pult. So just in terms of like metagame placement, Greninja might be in that mix by punishing the Maridon players to an extent and punishing Blissey players. Any random arc decks, which we haven't seen too much of uh, in this top 16 or whatever, but if those are lying around, there are still reasons to like that fighting type and still certainly is relevant. So let me know your thoughts uh, of the Champions League. What was the wildest list that you saw? What archetypes are you really excited to be coming back into the forefront in this metagame? And what's the new archetype that you want to be trying out from this set? So I'll hear it all down below. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you tomorrow for another one. Cheers.